Here's something that uh, I think was helpful for me, a text um, that, that's helped persuade me in this position. I find it very uh, persuasive. First, just to kind of play the devil's advocate against myself as I flesh out this thought. Some people might be listening and say, well, what about texts like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, uh, through, well, maybe four or five, where it says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, and it continues. Uh, but the main idea is the last days. And speaking, you know, a lot of people would, would look at that and say, well, there, there's a time coming. We're not there yet. Or maybe we are. You know, there's some people in the pre-mill persuasion that, well, I think most people in the pre-mill persuasion that, that feel as though Jesus is going to come back in these days at this moment um, throughout church history. Uh, most people have thought that, um, well, many people have thought, especially if they've hold, uh, held a pre-mill persuasion um, position, they've thought that Jesus was going to come back in their generation. But that last day's language, I think, is uh, really interesting, um, especially when you, when you link that with other texts. And I think a good one is Peter's sermon, uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, at Pentecost, where he says, um, starting in verse 14, uh, but Peter standing with the eleven, he lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all those who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine in the morning, the third hour of the day. Uh, but this was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he begins to preach uh, a prophecy that came from the prophet Joel Verse 17, Acts 2, he says, And in the last days, and it's the same kind of language, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Uh, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall all prophesy. And then he gets into judgment language. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And so it's this thing is going to happen then judgment is going to come. And we're going to get to this in a minute because I want to talk to you about um, preterism or partial preterism, the idea of the fall of Jerusalem, uh, the fall of the temple in AD 70, and a lot of that being prophesied about. But, but real briefly, the same kind of language is used in the last days. And then he describes Pentecost. He describes that the Spirit of God is going to pour out on all flesh, sons, daughters, old men, young men, male servants, female servants, um, this is going to happen in the last days. And, and what I find interesting, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. What I find interesting is, is cessationists who are pre-mill. And the reason why I find it interesting is those would be the first guys who would say, well, whoa, wait, 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 wait. The, you know, tongues, right? The, the spirit falling, your, your old men will dream dreams, young men see visions, and, you know, your, your daughters and sons are going to prophesy. Um, that, that time period, those last days, um, we're, we're speaking about the beginning of the church age, the apostolic era, and, and those supernatural sign gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased uh, at the end of the apostolic age. Not the end of the church age, which we're still in, but it ended at the end of the apostolic age. Uh, they were signs, precisely that. A sign is something that points towards something else, to give credibility, to give validity to the message ultimately of the gospel, of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so tongues um, have ceased. Uh, not all the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. We still have the gift of teaching and helps and administration, and lots of things like that, encouragement. Um, but, but these sign gifts have ceased. These supernatural gifts such as tongues or prophecy, uh, they've ceased. And But I guess the kind of what, what I want to hear your thoughts on, it's funny oh, yeah. to me that a cessationist would say the last days are behind us but then that same cessationist would be pre-mill. Right. <clears throat> can, can, right. You, can you help me understand? Well, yeah, I know. That's good. It's actually a really important it, it, an element of this entire discussion. That I said, you know, it's, it's, it's not good that this entire discussion is whittled down to the high, most highly symbolic book in the New Testament to this millennium. And the whole discussion was there because there's so many more elements that need to be discussed in the midst of this, like to pin it down to that one spot and classify it all there. I think it should be a discussion between Christian optimism and Christian pessimism. Uh, so an optimistic yeah. view of the future and a pessimistic view of the future. Um, but this is important when you remember that I mentioned that you see two common things tied together when these promises in the size kingdom are given in the Old Testament. And that is salvation and judgment, salvation and judgment. You'll even see them right there in the same passage. Uh, salvation, cleansing, the Lord comes to his temple, uh, Malachi chapter three, 
you know, the Lord himself comes to his temple, which is amazing because Yahweh came to his temple. Jesus came to his own temple. And then there's supposed to be purification and judgment upon the covenant breakers. Covenant judgment mm -hmm. is coming. Well, it's interesting here because in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Peter addresses the people in Jerusalem who have converged at this time in an amazing way. So the gospel goes out and then it goes boom across the empire. It's just so providential and powerful to see that take place. But the Spirit of God's poured out Pentecost. And then all of a sudden you see these amazing signs, right? You start seeing these amazing things. They're speaking in other people's languages and you've got prophecy right. and all that stuff. And what the apostle Peter says is he says, this, what you're seeing right now with all this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. So you go back to Joel, and what's interesting here is that Joel actually says that these the things are going days. to take place in the last days, and then what? You've got that dra a dramatic judgment. prophetic hyperbole that is so common in the Old Testament when God's bringing judgment. But the important thing to, to note here is this is in the context of Jerusalem. Jesus has told them that this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. These are the days of vengeance promises that your house is left to you desolate. Jesus says on the way to the cross to the women who are weeping for him, he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children, talking mm -hmm. to them because judgment was coming. Peter says this, what you're seeing, this, these signs is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In other words, Peter's telling them, this is a sign of coming judgment. What you're mm -hmm. watching right now, these signs are from God affirming what I'm saying about the Messiah and that you're about to be judged. And that's right. John the Baptist, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. The it's, tree. it's imminent. It's about we, to happen. We, we miss this, too. When we read about the accusation coming against, uh, coming against the first recorded martyr in the book of Acts, what were they accusing these Christians of spreading? What were they saying? They say specifically that he says that this Jesus is coming back to destroy these customs Moses delivered to us. Mm -hmm. In other words, he was speaking against the temple that this is all about to be destroyed, y'all. And it mm -hmm. also is interesting, didn't you, should we pay attention to the fact that in a really weird way, this is strange, the Christians living in Jerusalem at this time are selling all their property in Jerusalem. Why? Mm. Why were they selling their property in Jerusalem? <laughs> Why were these other Christians just giving up property and selling it? Because it yeah. wasn't good land to hold on to, considering the fact That's that right. Jesus told it's them the judge was coming. But it is interesting that you, you're making a point it's here. It's like Enron. Way. Like That's having a right. bunch of Enron yeah, yeah. stock. You know? yeah. yeah, they they yeah. had a they yeah. had a leg up in terms of like where the stock was going. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's interesting because we tend to hear the words "last days" um, or "end of the age," and we're thinking in terms of "oh, that's the end Future. of the world." But this right. language doesn't mean that. Uh, it doesn't have to mean that. It doesn't mean that. It's the last days of the old covenant, and this is an important point of this whole eschatological discussion. The Old Testament gives us two main parts of redemptive history. It gives us the Old Covenant age and then the promise of the coming New Covenant in Messiah's kingdom. That's what's divided. It's not overly complicated in terms of like, what, what's the, the spectrum here? What do we do to look for? It's the Old Covenant order and age, and there's a promise of Messiah's coming and a New Covenant. And so the last days here, I would argue the last days of that Old Covenant age, the last days of the Old Covenant order, which, by the way, is what Jesus says in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse, where the Great Tribulation right. passage is. Jesus has just declared woes upon the covenant-breaking leadership of Jerusalem. He says, right. your house is left to you desolate. And then when he departs from there, interestingly, he takes the exact same path. As Yahweh's glory departed before the destruction of the first temple— and then rested on the Mount of Olives. Now Yahweh is in flesh. He's incarnate. He declares mm. woes, and then his glory departs, and he rests on the Mount of Olives. Before the destruction wow. of the first temple, Yahweh did the same thing. And now wow. Jesus does that. And when he's talking to the disciples, they're kind of freaking out because he just told them the house is left in them desolate. So they're pointing out this amazing structure and this, the glory of the temple. And he says, do you see all these things? There shall not be left one stone upon another. And so he promises his destruction. And what did they ask? When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? End of the end of the age. They do not ask right. him about the end of the physical world. They are asking right. him about the end of the age. And Jesus just told them that temple is about to be destroyed. That whole order is going to be gone. They know he's the Messiah. They know Messiah brings the new covenant age, all of that. 
And so they associate the destruction with that old covenant order with the end of that age. So the end of the age mm -hmm. is not the end of the world. It's the end of the old covenant age and order. And you have here the last days, the last days of that old covenant age. Proof is that the context in Joel is judgment on the covenant breakers. It's mm -hmm. about them. I mean, this stuff is local. This is one of the things that you ask questions like, well, what are the things that really piqued your curiosity or like, oh, that's powerful. Well, that I think is associated and this gets us into the preterism discussion. I'm not sure if you really want to go there deep yet, but it's important to note that in the in say just Matthew 24, all this is going on. Temple's going to be going away. Here's all the things that are going to take place before you all die. All these things will take place in this generation using the near demonstrative, not that generation, but this generation. You, 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 talking to them, them, them. He tells them how they can escape it. So if this is mm -hmm. cataclysmic, global, Sweet. worldwide, earth-shattering and ending judgment in the Great Tribulation, then how are they going to escape it on foot right. by simply leaving Jerusalem? Because he tells right. them what to look for. When you see the abomination causes desolation, what the reader understands, spoken about Prophet Daniel. Well, if you just read Luke, Luke actually interprets that. Luke 21 says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. So whatever the abomination of desolation was, and there's lots of answers for this, Luke gives you the inspired interpretation. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee. Don't go back to get your coat. Don't, mm -hmm. You leave the city immediately and mm -hmm. flee. Well, it is interesting, too. Eusebius, uh, early uh, Christian, um, he records, and, and many of the early apologists use the destruction of Jerusalem to highlight the fact that Christ is vindicated, he is the Messiah. Well, Eusebius mm -hmm. actually records as a matter of historic record that um, that the early Christians in Jerusalem, when, when I'll, I'll fill in context here, when the Roman armies first came to Jerusalem and the Roman Jewish war started, they surrounded the city. Stuff started falling apart in Rome. So they go to sack the city and then all of a sudden they leave. They turn around and go back. Now, it's a matter of historic record that the Christians who were in Jerusalem at the time, because they had been giving warning from Jesus, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee, they then fled the city to a town called Pella. That's what Eusebius records, that those Christians escaped the judgment on Jerusalem because they had a word from God vouchsafed for them, and so they escaped on foot to Pella. Then all of a sudden, the Roman armies turned back around and resacked the city, and of course, we know what took place after that. So it is interesting. You tie all these things together in Scripture. They knew they were talking about them. That's how the Christians interpreted it. They escaped the city. And, um, and so this is not about the last days of human history, but the last days of that old covenant order. It was the end of mm -hmm. the old covenant age. Yeah, super helpful. Thank you. So we're already there talking about preterism and and the Olivet Discourse, and I know that you know some people, even atheists, uh, people who are trying to disprove um, the teachings of Jesus and the validity of Scripture, would actually use um, texts like that, that you know, where Jesus says that all these things will come to pass uh, before this generation passes away, that some in this generation will not fall asleep, they will not pass away before these things uh, come to pass. And people will use that and say, see, Jesus, you know, he's a false prophet. Jesus, his prediction, his prophecy did not come true. Um, that generation has been gone for 2,000 years, give or take, and, you know, and the end of the age hasn't come. And so if you're understanding this, you know, the Olivet Discourse is Jesus kind of prophesying about the end of the world, um, then, uh, you know, his, his glorious return in the flesh, then you're going to have some problems. And so Thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch more content like this. Also, take a moment and give this video a like so that it can reach more people. And take a moment and click on the bell so that you'll be notified whenever we come out with new content. Thanks so much. God bless.